Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Welcome to the third episode of the Econ Talk Book Club on the Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith with Dan Klein of George Mason University. Today's podcast is on part two of the book. Go to econtalk.org slash bookclub.html to find an online version of the book, how to buy the book if you want a hard copy and other resources, along with links to the previous episodes. Dan, thanks for being part of the book club again. Thank you. So our goal today is to discuss part two. What is part two about? Um, Part two of merit and demerit or of the objects of reward and punishment consisting of three sections. Um, First section of the sense of merit and demerit. Um, And so these merit and demerit go look at consequences and effects of actions as well as the motives. Um, a little later, in a few pages, he explains that these um, notions of merit and demerit, um, in particular gratitude and resentment, gratitude for merit, resentment for demerit, are what he calls compounded sentiments because the, the action that one is grateful for, um, let's say Jim helps his neighbor Bert, so Bert is grateful to Jim, Jim's action has to have flown from good motives, um, proper motives, as well as actually had merit in terms of consequences. So these are compounded in that both motives and consequences and effects matter. Um, And merit elicits gratitude, deserves reward. Um, Demerit uh, perhaps deserves punishment and uh, occasions resentment. Gratitude and resentment, we learn, um, are feelings on our part which prompt us to towards moral agency in reacting. It's not enough just that we feel gratitude or we feel resentment. Those, again, are sort of active passions which sort of spur us to be moral agents in a way which reacts to Jim uh, showing our gratitude, you know, returning something, if, even if it's just an expression of appreciation. And similarly with resentment, it's a moving passion. um, And we want, if we're going to sort of retaliate against someone uh, who we resent, um, we want that person to know why we're doing this, okay, and how we reacted to um, what they did. So it really sees that as a a desire to transform that person to, 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 almost to educate them more than to punish them. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure back exactly what passage doesn't jump to mind, but it sounds it sounds absolutely right. that, And it's, again, part of a dialectic where it's like a way of communicating how this hit me, you know, how this affected me. Like, you weren't mindful of me, or or maybe you knew it would ha- happen to me this way and you didn't care, but you should care, or you should know. So, so yes, it's actually part of a discovery procedure, if you want to use, use Hayek's phrase. Um, but these active passions, uh, he briefly distinguishes from what are more passive sentiments, uh, for, for example, on the positive side, love and esteem, and on the negative side, he has hatred and dislike, um, and those do not necessarily prompt towards a sort of moral agency. This distinction between active moral agency and passive um, experience is quite important, I think, in Smith, um, and it crops up time and again. One of the most famous occasions, uh, which we'll get to later, is the earthquake in China. Um, but I think it's a very important distinction. You know, people just talk about, you know, what would be your attitude about this and your attitude about that, and it matters a lot if we're talking, if, if the counterfactual, if the thought experiment is one of moral agency. You know, what would I think about, you know, um, I don't know, uh, some business opening up or someone prospering or someone failing. or well, I don't know, I don't, but, but it matters a lot if, if you make me a moral agent, 
of it happening, okay? And he says that, that that's a very important distinction. He says that um, we may dislike a neighbor or somebody and actually be happy to see him ruined or something like that, but to actually be a moral agent and to violate justice in doing that, you know, is just the most it, terrible thing. It's abhorrent to us, he it's, says. Right. Yeah. And so, and this is actually important, I think, in economics uh, in, in that – we talk about efficiency as though it's a well-defined thing, right? kind of a precise notion. I think for a great many reasons, it's actually loose, vague, and indeterminate. And it seems to me that this would be one. I mean, when we talk about people's willingness to pay or be paid, are we – is the counterfactual, the, the hypothetical one where they have moral agency or not? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, what are people's willingness to pay um, – I don't know, to have a school voucher system or to uh, – Let's talk about tariffs. That's a good example where – Tariffs. You know, where a tariff changes the economic well-being of of a set of workers in a domestic industry. We, removing a tariff. Let's remove right. a tariff. Yes, yes. And domestic workers are going to be harmed. Uh, consumers are going to be better off. Domestic workers harmed. Some stockholders harmed. The standard economic argument is that's efficient if the gains to the consumers are large enough – that they could compensate those who have been harmed. Um, I've always found that to be a problematic – excuse me. At some point in my life, I decided that was a very problematic notion. Early in my career as an economist, I thought that was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I taught my students. Precise and accurate. uh, Yeah, it's precise and accurate. There's a nice shape in the graph that you can show the gains and losses. And it's really good for exam questions because it gets really complicated under certain circumstances. But – uh, morally, it started to bother me for a couple of reasons. One is the compensation never takes place, although we have something vaguely like it called trade adjustment assistance. And then you have to ask the question, should it take place? <laughs> and this is the moral question. If somebody through political force has artificially benefited from protection and we take the protection away, should they be compensated? And then even more complicated is the fact that the workers themselves were not probably part of the enterprise that imposed the protection. So you don't really want to say that that their gains their gains were were immoral, ill gotten. Yeah. gotten. They just happened to be in an industry that got protection. Right. So it, it's yeah, it, those issues are relevant right. in everybody's mind except right. economists at a blackboard. Yeah, Everybody yeah. else worries about that and cares about it deeply. And Smith's the, saying they should. You lift the tariffs or quotas on sugar or dairy products, whatever it is, and people in a passive sense gain because they pay less at the store. And, you know, all these consumers have these widespread large gains. But if you ask any one of them, will you press the button to remove these restrictions, all, puts, all of a sudden they're the moral agent and they're like – uh, and even if you explain to them that there'll be these widespread consumer gains, they're like, well, I know that lo- that losses loom larger than gains and people are going to lose their jobs and I will have been the one morally responsible and they may not be ready to push the button. So in one way, it's a plot that, you know, their willingness to pay is a benefit for removing the restriction. But it, in terms of their actual willingness to push the button or their willingness to pay to push the button, it might be zero or negative. And that's why I think that the – Economists' standard argument for free trade is not particularly compelling to a non-economist. Um, and it's why in my book, The Choice, although I mention those gains, that certainly getting rid of trade restrictions make us more prosperous. Um, and you can argue that they're moral. Yeah. But for me, much of the reason to be against protectionism and to be in favor of free trade is it allows us to express our talents and gifts in a more open society. Yeah. And that's more important than the in our society, which is relatively wealthy. Those human benefits that are not quantifiable about self-expression and, and using one's gifts are, to me, much more compelling than the fact that a bunch of consumers are going to pay less for sugar. I mean, that's just yeah. not exciting, and, and and shouldn't be exciting. And in a poorer country, it could be a matter of life and death. In which case, I think yeah. the material benefits and costs are more relevant. But for our society, which is a large society that already has enormous gains from trade just within borders, um, I think the non-monetary aspects of free trade are, are extremely important. Yeah. One way just to continue on this, to go back to the efficiency criteria, and one way to try to salvage that in light of this 
to say, okay, that citizen's not willing to push the button, not ready to pay much to push the button to remove the restrictions, but they should be, okay, that they have the wrong preferences, that, that their enlightened preferences or their true preferences after they've studied Adam Smith and political economy and have the right moral universe – would be to pay a lot to push that button. Yeah, you and I would pay a lot to push it. Yeah, but, but then you're like saying that the efficiency criterion of willingness to pay is what you think people's true or proper or enlightened preferences are, which is throwing you totally into the loose, vague, and indeterminate. Yeah, good point. And that's why it's really loose, vague, and indeterminate and not one of the, one of the many reasons, I think. Um, anyhow, um, so he's saying that... Um, we in consider suppose we're spectating an interaction of two other people, an actor and an acted upon. Um, we're, we how we evaluate the actor's action depends not only on you know what we think of his motives and his consequences, but also on the reactions of the other person. And to some extent, we we key off that. Um, it, we view uh, the actor through the eyes of the person acted upon. Um, and this is something actually that plays a significant role in his lectures on rhetoric and bell letters where he's talking about literature novels uh, and so on. Um, and he talks about how um, stylistically authors often you know, don't show the direct consequence of the action, but they show how people react to the reaction, which we're all familiar from when we watch movies, you know. Part of the footage is, you know, Godzilla stomping on Manhattan, but part of the footage is like people being shocked and like amazed. And that's what we, that's another way of entering into it. Um, and you see this actually right in the, in his, his lectures on the rec, on rhetoric and bell letters. There's quite a bit of parallels there. Um, and when it comes to, um, let's suppose the actor is a murderer and the acted upon is now dead. Okay, you mentioned that he's got a lot of death in these yeah. pages. Um, how do you sympathize with that person? They're dead. Um, but we manage. Yeah, we manage. It's an amazing thing. That's, that's right. On page 71, he speaks of elusive sympathy um, or imaginary resentment where he says, you know, he's very – Smith's method um, is to always have this spectate. It's a spectatorial – construct. His uh, Smith scholars use this term that he's got basically a, a spectatorial construct for everything. And a spectator is always sort of mediating our reactions. Um, and so even when it comes to the person uh, being dead at this point, and hence not actually um, having any sentiments about it at this point, um, he says, we imagine how they would feel. Uh, and he starts – but this is an important step. I think uh, on page 71, I think is the first time that he starts talking about um, a kind of imaginary uh, sentiment and hence a, our coordinating to what is an imaginated – you know, an imagined sentiment. And this is the – this is the beginnings of the impartial spectator, okay, which really doesn't come in – I don't think until part three in, in, in like the real central way about our judging ourselves and consulting our own and having coordinated sentiment with this internal spectator, which mm -hmm. is a pretty, a pretty wild thing. Um, but it starts here with elusive sympathy and imaginary resentment. Um, now, all this business about um, seeing things in the same light as the actor, in order for us to fully enter into um, how the, the acted upon sees the action, we have to actually agree with how the acted upon sees it. And this, again, relates to politics. It's like people might be grateful to um, government for all that it does for them. I mean, you know, government seems to be generous in a sense in looking out for these people. And then you consult the people acted upon, okay, voters, whatever, people in the school systems, recipients of Medicare and Social Security, what have you, they might feel gratitude, right? Yeah, they often do. But he says we must um, see the actor, in this case, say the government, in the same light um, as object to enter into objects. Sent, I'm sorry. We have to see it the same. We have to s see the government the same way that the recipient does. And if we don't agree, essentially, with the um, – recipients sentiments uh, 
we may not have that same praise, you know, or uh, gratitude, sense of gratitude or merit for the original actor, all right? Um, and so again, we get into, the, you know, if you want to politicize this, uh, you get into questions about whether people's that moral evaluations are, are converging and dovetailing. And partly is that people have different ideas of what these broad consequences and whether you should be grateful for the whole system, at least. Uh, I got confused there. I, I, I thought you said two different things that seem to be contradictions. Does Smith want us to look at the recipients or use our own judgment in deciding whether it's a moral act? Because often yeah. the example you gave was the recipients like it. They're grateful to government. Right. So, I mean we should be grateful too. But if we think it's destructive or harmful, are we supposed to put that to the side? Um, we are not supposed to put that to the side. We can sort of not enter into or not approve of the, that gratitude. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and so in a sense then we wouldn't coordinate our sentiments with that gratitude – uh, and that would be part of our judgment about the policy, you know, the actor in this case. I was going to complain that I don't think of government as generous. Yeah. Because government isn't a, doesn't have emotions. Now, politicians act as if they're generous. Right. But usually with other people's money. So I have a little trouble with thinking of them as generous either. But I think certainly don't want to say that government is generous. But but people do think of it that way. And you're, you know, I think we did a podcast on on your point about the romance people have about government, mm -hmm. and certainly you've written on it. I think that that is often the way people think of it. Yeah, and it's one way to look at it. I, you know, it's a, yeah, it's not the way I look at it, but um, and this whole business of the, of, of the compounded nature uh, of of sentiment here when we when we judge the merit or demerit of um, of action and per perhaps government action uh, relates again to um, what we said in the last podcast about it mattering whether or not people affected are expressing how they're affected and expressing their feelings about how they're affected, particularly, for example, if they're being taxed or being restricted, if they're expressing indignation, resentment against that, um, if people stop doing that, it, we lose, you know, th then that aspect of the original action tends to get lost, right? And it becomes less seen um, and the official or intended actions of the whole thing. So I do think politics, again, um, tends to highlight certain aspects, certain consequences, and sort of to silence, right, um, certain reactions to them. Uh, he makes on pages 77 and thereafter um, quite a bit of reference to providential nature. Uh, I think this is maybe where he really starts uh, waxing most about that or in a large way about that. Um, and he says that uh, nature gave us an instinct for revenge or for retaliation, I think partly um, – because, you know, he's concerned that uh, you do express, you do sort of send a moral message back uh, and that people who, who violate justice or propriety or what have you um, uh, know it and sort of get checked. Um, and we do that revenge and retaliation, not necessarily, again, for any reason other than sort of the principle and uh, – uh, just yeah, nobody nobody intends to make the world a better place by taking revenge on the their um, a murderer. They are just motivated by a passion. Yeah, and I thought that was a, a really uh, a deep and important insight. It, it really is almost a. I've, I've had people tell me that you know we have to have laws against murder. Maybe some laws aren't aren't important, but of course we have to have laws against murder. And you know it's not obvious to me how many how much murder is deterred by a law against murder. Murder in a world without a law against it, there'd be a lot more revenge. There'd be all <laughs> kinds of private mechanisms. There'd yeah. be more gang defense. There'd be more tribal defense. There'd be more care. I mean, there'd be a thousand things to take. And, you know, God forbid that the law against murder is what keeps people from murdering people. And most murderers, of course, a lot of murderers get away with it. So to me, mm -hmm. the, the, the combination of, of restraints on you know, the personal morality of seeing murders wrong. Plus, the potential for revenge is a big deterrent. 
Yeah. And that's really what he's saying. And this instinct for it is something we can imagine. I mean, we can imagine being evolutionarily selected. That is, in societies where people had um, this instinct, they tended to survive because it kept bad behavior in check. Because yeah. you know, um, but of course, he doesn't make an evolutionary argument. He just invokes he invokes providential nature. Um, and he says, such matters have not been in, entrusted to the slow and uncertain determinations of our reason. Um, <laughs> he says, instead, it's by an original and immediate instinct. Um, which is interesting, you know, because he's got all of this stuff about how our instinct and nature um, actually can be supported and defended by uh, the slow and uncertain determinations of our reason, you know, working things out. Um, it's, 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 so it's, it's all very conducive to, uh, I think, an evolutionary kind of thing. Um, in that long footnote, uh, which we alert, alluded to last time, we picked up on one aspect of it, but uh, this is on page 78 uh, in my edition. Um, there's another aspect to it where, again, he... Um, well, this is really that point. Right? Well, I'll come back to it. You make your point, and I'll come back to it. If you're not making my point. <laughs> uh, well, there's two points. There's two points. There's a couple points in this long footnote. The one I was going to make was, again, about elusive sympathy. Go ahead. Um, where he says, suppose Jim acted on Bert, okay, and Bert fails to be grateful. Um, nonetheless, what Jim did was actually meritorious and deserving of praise um, and approval. So... How is it that we approve of something when the person when there's no gratitude by the person affected? Mm -hmm. And again, Smith wants to preserve this sense of sympathy sort of at each step. So what he does is he says, we imagine a Bert who is grateful. <laughs> who is grateful, exactly. Because he should be. That's, That's right. All. We imagine the sympathy that Bert should feel, essentially, or that the should Bert would have if you will. Um, and again, this is a step towards the imaginary construct. And it shows his sort of principle of, I'm always going to insert a spectator and have sympathy there, right? Mm -hmm. Even if I have to kind of manufacture the spectator to suit, you know, the judgment, which is often what it borders on, surely. But, you know, he, he, he says that we have those sort of spectatorial guides and that we learn how to develop their sense, our, our understanding of their sensibilities, okay? And we then carry forward their judgments, okay? Kind of as markers as we go through the world. Not that we know a full description of their sensibilities in some rich way, like, you know, how Mozart writes a symphony, but we have all these markers of like, oh, in that case, it's almost like precedent. It's almost like common law, right? Like the judgment was this, and we had worked through why that makes sense, and that seemed acceptable, and it seemed acceptable to this other figure, whether it was, you know... Grateful Bert. Yeah, or Blackstone or whoever, you know, I mean... Um, and and we go, we by, based on all of these precedences and sort of focal points, uh, kind of constructing these guides... Uh, who who's, he is then saying we have this kind of coordinated sentiment with, um, but it's showing it's showing the the the, uh, the tendency there there on Smith. The next thing is I was going to sure. my, my comment on the footnote is is goes back to our earlier point of a few minutes ago, where at the bottom he says uh, at the, towards the end of it he says hunger thirst the passion which unites the two sexes the love of pleasure and the dread of pain prompt us to apply those means for their own sakes and without any consideration of their tendency to those beneficent ends which the great director of nature intended to produce by them. So he's sort of saying that it's sort of the uh, the providential law of, of unintended consequences. When we act out of hunger to produce a new product that's going to make the world a better place, we only intend our own hunger to be assuaged by the money we're going to get. But there's a hidden, unexpected, unintended consequence, and you know I think he's trying to he's making this 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 point that there are these fuller effects 
yeah. that we'd want to take into account. Yeah. He's got this providential, invisible hand yeah. premise yeah. behind everything, basically. Um, so should we get into justice and beneficence? Yeah. We discussed that some previously in the first po- podcast, um, but perhaps there's some things we didn't hit or we want to repeat. Um, Many interesting things in it. Mm. So he says that, first of all, he says that justice is necessary, precise, and accurate, and can be enforced uh, with force, with physical force. Um, anyone who violates justice can be forced uh, to stop and to be forcefully punished, um, whereas beneficence has to be voluntary, it has to be free, um, and should never be forced. This is at least among equals, again, the, mostly the whole discussion is among equals. Um, And then he does have that chapter about the superior. Um, But among equals, uh, beneficence can never be forced or should never be forced. In fact, it wouldn't be beneficence if it was forced. Beneficence is like uh, the rules of sublime and elegant writing, loose, vague, and indeterminate. It's kind of like an aesthetic becoming kind of practice. Justice is like grammar, precise and necessary. And he says that um, justice and grammar are but negative virtues. And the way I read this is that in assessing or evaluating somebody's grammar or compliance with justice, the only feedback you'd give them is of a negative nature. Like you made these grammatical errors, you made these justice violations, now go fix it, you know? If somebody got their grammar all right and their justice all right, you don't say great job. Right, Right, because there's a rather large range that would fulfill the rules of grammar. There's writing that fulfills the rules of grammar and there are actions that are not unjust and yet there's much there to be a lot of leeway there. Right. Merely fulfilling uh, the rules of grammar is not cause for any positive evaluation. Or praise. No approbation there to use. No approbation. It's one of his favorite But words. of course, violations call for disapprobation. Yes. So it's a merely negative virtue, whereas beneficence, which is like aesthetics, is both positive and negative. You know, you, can pra- you totally can praise somebody for the sublime and elegant nature of things. Um, and, and so this, this helps draw the distinction. Uh, and and uh, you can't get positive approbation merely by satisfying the rules of grammar again, because you know if you turn in for your homework a blank piece of paper, right, that yeah. fulfills all the rules of grammar, not a single grammatical error. It's a blank piece of paper, uh, but it totally fails as any kind of uh, aesthetic composition. And similarly, he says that we can often fulfill all the rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing. So it's again, but but a negative uh, virtue. Yeah, no, that's that's quite that's quite interesting. Uh, I guess it's an interesting legal question, right? The, the Good Samaritan law. If you uh, it says in the Bible, "Do not stand idly by when the blood of your neighbor is being shed," but you don't get punished for failing to leap into a fight to save an innocent victim. And I guess there's a debate about whether you should be punished for failing to save a drowning person if you're a great swimmer, right? Yeah. If Michael Phelps walks by and there's somebody str- you know, struggling in the water and he says, oh, you know, I didn't shove him yeah. in there. I'm, I have no obligation. Most people would say, get in the water. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, it's, not, it's a very low standard. That's right. And strictly speaking, I think um, the law in line with Smith's commutative justice would not require it and would not punish the person who stood idly by. He specifies, as we've said, uh, the content of this commutative justice. On page 84, where he speaks of the sacred laws of justice, I consider sort of the most uh, fullest description. It's He talks of property, um, person, and promises do you, right, by contract. Yep. Although on 82, where it's a little briefer, he also mentions reputation. like um, Not to harm the reputation yeah. of a, of a so neighbor. Those are, those are your, that's your stuff, as it were, your person, your property, your, the promises do you. Uh, and in the other case, he includes also reputation. And again, as we saw in the paragraph on justices later in the book, um, he describes commutative justice as abstaining from what is another's. So I am not to mess with Russ's person, property, or promises due you in contract. Um, 
Is the commutative justice your word or his? It's it's his. That's his, the word commutative in front of it. Here at this point in, in part two, he only call, call Absolutely. He, quote only calls them the sacred laws of justice. It's not only it, that's to me the highest. In, it seems like that would be his pinnacle, uh, whether right. reputations included or not from the previous pages. But but the, the modification of the word justice with commutative is, comes later. It comes later when he's reviewing other doctrines. Um, he re, he associates it. Uh, uh, with Aristotle and what he calls the schoolmen, where they call it commutative justice. So I think it's significant that he doesn't call it commutative earlier on and that he never calls beneficence and those things distributive justice. In other words, he's saying when we speak of justice and when we – or what, at least when we address justice, that's just – you know, we can just speak of justice simpliciter, right? Just uh, there's just commutative justice. Don't call these other things justice. Basically, he's saying implicitly. It seems to me. I do think there's some ambiguity, certainly, about this. But um, the fact that he just calls commutative justice justice when he actually addresses it, I think, is very significant in thinking about you know what his political sensibilities were. Uh, if he pretty much wants to just mean that by the word justice, that means that means a lot, I think. Um, this chapter, what page was it again where he talks about the sacred laws of justice? 84. Yeah, the chapter that that's in is really some of the best writing in the in the book up so far for me. He talks he starts out by talking about this fundamental principle I've often reminded students of that people think more about, you think more about yourself than other people do. You know, a student will come to me and say, I, I sent this, I applied for this job, I sent this email, and I haven't heard a thing. I guess I'm not going to get it. And I want to say, you know, in your mind, the person you've sent that email to is thinking about you constantly, like you are. You're thinking, when am I going to hear him? I, is he reading back? You're checking your email every five minutes. You know, he's busy. He just didn't get to it. It's nothing personal. You haven't, it doesn't mean anything. But we often – it's bizarre how easy it is to forget that and assume that we're as important to other people as we are to ourselves. And Smith explicitly says not. But he has this incredible passage right before the sacred laws of justice. He says, though every man may, according to the proverb, be the whole world to himself, to the rest of mankind he is a most insignificant part of it. Though his own happiness may be of more importance to him – than that of all the world besides. To every other person, it is of no more consequence than that of any other man. Though it may be true, therefore, that every individual in his own breast naturally prefers himself to all mankind, yet he dares not look mankind in the face and avow that he acts according to this principle. Now, this is kind of obvious, and yet it's interesting how hard it is for people to keep this in mind. And later on, he has this same page, as this incredible passage where he says, um, uh, Whenever they place themselves, excuse me, in the race for wealth and honors and preferments, he may run as hard as he can and strain every nerve and every muscle in order to outstrip all his competitors. But if he should jostle or throw down any of them, the indulgence of the spectators is entirely at an end. It is a violation of fair play, which they cannot admit of. This man is to them in every respect as good as he. They do not enter into that self-love by which he prefers himself so much to this other and cannot go along with the motive from which he hurt him. So this – I assume jostle is – the modern word is jostle. Like you were thinking about a, a race where you elbow one of your, your, mm -hmm. your fellow runners. Mm -hmm. And you know this idea that, well, I'm really great. So, of course, I can shove this guy aside, cheat a little bit because I deserve it. That's a very human motive. But he's pointing out that others don't quite see it that way. Yeah. And while you might be glad if your competitor accidentally fell again, right. in a passive way, you'd be glad, but you would never – He would. He, Smith would presume you would never think of jostling him. Well, you might, but it would be wrong. Right. And you wouldn't, you, many of us would be horrified to, to, to think of it. And then finally, just like in one more passage, uh, mm -hmm. just a great aphorism, which ref I think we talked about this in the last podcast – to be deprived of that which we are possessed of is a greater evil than to be disappointed of what we have only the expectation. This is the um, the gains and losses are not symmetric. Mm -hmm. The behavioral yes. economics reference that that we discussed last last time. Yeah. Um, on eighty seven through the following pages, again he talks about how um, utility is not our primary. Um, 
source of sentiment or a primary sentiment, but um, again, notions of justice uh, and sensibilities are. Um, I don't know if you did you have anything? On, okay. No, I just I, um, I, are you talking about the beginning of uh, the section that starts? It is us. It is thus that man who can subsist only in society. The uh, start of chapter three. Uh, no, Ross, I'm not sure. Uh, that I part, I, I double start and, and, and underline the first couple chapters. It's uh, uh -huh. um, just a rather um, rather dramatic statement that, that off, I think is shocking for the caricature view of Smith and the Wealth of Nations. He's basically mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. that um, if, it's, if the relationships between us are purely mercenary – and all we care about is our own self-interest, our interactions will not be as effective as if we have some fellow feeling. Um, and yeah. this would seem to contradict – it doesn't, but it would seem to contradict this sort of view, the, the view that you know, it's not through the benevolence of the butcher and the baker. So what he's, he's – there's not yeah. a contradiction, but what he's saying here is that a little benevolence would be better than none. If you don't have any, it still works pretty well, he says, but it would be better if there were some benevolence between them, yeah. some mutual love, affection, et cetera. Yeah, and I think he's suggesting that it is there at the lattices of all of the great machine uh, of uh, the economy or the great concatenation. Um, the society flourishes and is happy when there is that sympathy you know when you go to the store or at work at the workplace and everything else i think there's actually yeah uh it wasn't where i was going but that's fine um and then he says uh all the different members of it think of this as the great concatenation right uh are bound together by the agreeable bands of love and affection i mean in a sense he's he's kind of suggesting here a beauty that we hope people can see themselves as part of um, all the different members of it, sort of this vast concatenation, are bound together by the agreeable bands of love and affection and are, as it were, drawn to one common center of mutual good offices. I don't really know what the center is exactly, but I think he's – I think he means – I thought he meant a shared feeling of being part of something larger than yourself, some great enterprise that you're achieving through these interactions. Yeah, I suppose so. Um it, I, the metaphor of center, the center of what? I mean, it's there's kind of like not physical, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Kind of it. You are part of it, and it's at the center of. Um, yeah. But anyway, it is a kind of poetic, um, spontaneous order, almost as a religion, kind of. You know, as a substitute religion, like let's serve the great concatenation, the spontaneous order, and appreciate that in a kind of. Um, you know, sentimental way, a meaningful way, a, a sense of connection. I don't really have that much hope for that kind of um, sentiment and, and, and meaning for somebody. Um, I mean, I think there's something to it, and I think it's quite lovely. I th believe it's what Durkheim sort of advocated in his Division of Labor book, kind of like now that commerce has sort of rendered society all fractionated and diverse and divided, um, we have to kind of imagine and see this vast concatenation and draw and sort of celebrate the vast division of labor that we belong to and which brings us together, as Smith here, with, through bands of love and affection. Now, that's going a little far. Yeah, but you're skipping the first part, and I'm going to give mm. you a hard time Go here because I think this is, this is a little bit of a challenge to our um, uh, division of labor world that we live in. He, he says – the sentence before that he says, where the necessary is well, – actually, let me back up, read it from the beginning. It is thus that man who can subsist only in society was fitted by nature to that situation for which he was made. All the members of human society stand in need of each other's assistance and are likewise exposed to mutual injuries. Where the necessary assistance is reciprocally, reciprocally afforded from love, from gratitude, from friendship and esteem, the society flourishes and is happy. He's going to contrast that with one where we really don't care about each other at all. There's no gratitude. There's no love. There's no esteem. But we just have a mercenary uh, grad grind, to use the Dickens character we talked about in the first uh, podcast. Uh, we just have this mercenary connection. He said, well, the mercenary world, that works pretty well. 
but not as well as if we have this uh, mutual respect, love, affection, and friendship. Yeah. And that seems to me to be, um, you know, going back to the earlier story I think I told in the first podcast, the Walter Williams story of, you know, where do our potatoes and steak and potatoes come from? They come from people looking out for their own self-interest, trying to make a lot of money, Mm -hmm. not from people who care about me. And in a modern world of divisional labor, I better not rely on love and affection because I'm not going to get much of it. They're strangers. So this is – I'm not quite sure how this fits in with a more traditional, Mm -hmm. laissez-faire commercial world. Well, he says – and continues, all the different members of it are bound together. This is of society, of human society. By the He's talking about our mutual need. He's talking about the fact that if I live by drawn, myself, I'm going to die. He says to, to, to subsist. What, what, what possibly are all the different members of society drawn to one common center of mutual good offices? I'm not sure what that means either. I mean, I don't either, but it seems like he he's says, got— as it were. <laughs> yeah, he does sure say it as it were. Either. But the way I was reading it is that um, everybody's participating almost in a cooperative, almost in one vast enterprise. Agreed. But that's metaphorical. Absolutely. Um, they're not really, it's not really one vast organization uh, in which we all have this sort of coordinated uh, no, understanding. It. But it seems like he's sort of almost suggesting the myth of that uh, as one common center of mutual good offices. Let me give a different interpretation. A lot of people will claim, I don't know if it's true, and I don't, you know this literature, extremely well, so you should talk about it, and I'll shut up. But a lot of people say capitalism doesn't work very well unless you have, and then you can fill in the blank. One word is trust. You know, the claim is the attempts to trans to use capitalism in societies that don't have a lot of trust, yeah. don't work very well, um, that you have to use more top-down methods to enforce expectations. It's much better to have a informal world where people basically can count on the other person to do the right thing, and so they do the right thing. And to me, what this paragraph is about is saying, you know, it's really a more pleasant world when people are decent to one another. You know, for example, um, I've used this example before, you know, you go to buy a house and you specify in the closing contract what comes with the house, but you don't specify everything in America. America, you sort of – there's this understood set of things that are included in the house. No, the, the fancy chandelier might not be included and it might say so explicitly. But the house has a certain vague – to go back to your phrase before, it's a bunch of loose, yeah. vague, and indeterminate expectations. Yeah. And you kind of want to get – when you sell your house, you want to leave it in a condition you'd like to find yeah. your house in when you move in. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Now, if it if you don't have that, if yeah. people are grasping and – and and yeah. inconsiderate. Well, yeah, it'll still you can still sell houses. You can as long as you have the rule of law and you have contracts. But it works better when people are pleasant and nice and decent. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the next paragraphs sort of speak to. Um, I think he's saying in the first paragraph, which we've dwelled on, it could, it'd be kind of nice to think of it as some joint lovey dovey project. Yeah. But then he's saying, um, in fact. Uh, It may still be upheld by a mercenary exchange of good offices according to an agreed-upon value. Nothing that lovey-dovey. So in a way, I really don't think he is uh, hoping that people find great spiritual meaning in being connected to the global economy. And then he goes on to say that all that's necessary in order for the good offices actually to be forthcoming is the maintenance of justice. Justice is the pillar of society, beneficence is less essential uh, to the existence of society than justice. Um, well, because he says, to me, he's contrasting three things: a world where people are pleasant and decent, a world where they're not particularly yeah. nice to each other, and That's then a right. world of vicious animals. That's and that right. last world, That's good. That's you're good. hopeless. You're never yeah. going to be able to pull off. Uh, um, uh, That's right. A, a dis, uh, you know, uh, the division of labor, but in the in the yeah. in the first two, you're going to do great. And the first one's kind of just a happy, fanciful thought, and learn <laughs> to get used to the second, right? Could be, yeah. And definitely don't go to the third, where justice is being trampled and, and and things of that nature. Anyway, this does lead into the utility discussion about again this theme. I don't have a quote handy about. Um, why it's not the utility of it all that first moves us and prompts us, but our understandings. Um, But I wanted to bring attention to page 89. um, And he says, sometimes people advocate um, measures, policies, 
um, that we think are wrong that, that they shouldn't advocate. Um, maybe we can think of these as like very misguided m- m- interventions. Um, he says, we must show them, therefore, that it ought to be so for the sake of something else. He's saying um, that we, you ought to oppose these measures for reasons other than, um, for example, that you don't like the people advocating them. Right. you got to show that there's a reason to not like them for advocating them, not like them for advoc- advocating those measures, okay? Um, upon this account, we generally cast about for other arguments, and the consideration which first occurs to us is the disorder and confusion of society, which would result from the universal prevalence of such practices. We seldom fail, therefore, to insist upon this topic. So in other words, again, uh, he's showing how the different levels, the different sources of moral approval will interconnect and call each other forth. At the lower level, something seems wrong to us, and maybe we even hate those darn you know, activists, protesters, whatever we might want to call them. Um, but it's not just because we hate them. It's actually, you know. It's consequences. It, yeah. It, it's like it's like I have reason for defending their deservingness of hatred or their deservingness of dislike. Mm-hmm. And so it does roll back to this more impartial um, discussion or conversation of why and the broader consequences, again, going back to that fourth source. So again, the whole moral dynamics do sort of lead us to that broader picture, that broader conversation, which we hope, we hope is functioning, is functioning well and, and approaching greater wisdom. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure there's other stuff in the justice and beneficence section. Um, Should we move on to section three? Sure, Russ. Yeah. Uh, so this is of the. Inf- this is really interesting. I thought this was the most, some of the most interesting stuff so far. Yeah, this is a long section. About fortune. Yes, Mostly. and what, but what he means by fortune is chance, yeah. luck, yeah, right, uncertainty. Um, exactly. Um, and what he's got in this section, as I read it, is essentially a great many examples of what he calls this irregularity of sentiment. And then finally, at the end, a couple of pages uh, of his explanation for the irregularity. And what is this irregularity? Well, first, he, um, he, he now breaks out three things upon which praise and blame are, are based, um, rather than just intentions and consequences. He now has intentions or affection of the heart, that is, of the actor. He then specifies that actor's external action, literally movement of the body, you know, what the guy actually did. And then third, the consequences of what uh, he did. And in there uh, would be um, basically variables, random variables, you know, probabilities are in there. And... um, But also... Go ahead. But also, I mean, what I found most interesting about this section was his insights into the psychology of sort of blame and praise. Mm -hmm. You know, the architect who doesn't get to build this gorgeous house, instead, you know, he builds this great blueprint, someone else gets gets to build it. The architect doesn't get so much credit. We see this all the time in in the business world. We see it in sports. We see it in our daily lives where you've got to have some agency. Uh, He talks about the general who had a brilliant scheme, but he didn't get to implement it. So he's not seen as a great general. He's right. seen – he doesn't get any credit for it. And one view says, well, yeah, well, he didn't do it. So he doesn't deserve any credit. The other is that, well, come on. The best you could hope for is he had a good plan. Right. And why doesn't that – the whole thing that he – that's what he had control over. Yeah. And yet we don't act that way. And I thought the, the psychological part of this yeah. was extremely interesting. Yeah. He sets it up by saying it seems philosophically that our praise and blame – ought to look really only to the intention, okay? Uh, what The effort, right? A for effort. The thought that counts, too, which is yeah. the, going back to step one. Yeah. Right? You got two different guys. They make, let's say, the exact same effort. And in one, guy, in one case, it actually all pans out because the probability came up 
you know, aces for him or what have right. you. And the other guy that probably didn't pan out, the first guy who succeeded gets a lot more praise, but it's the exact same effort as the second guy. And he, and he says that by sort of philosophical reasoning, they deserve equal praise. For sure. And, the, and, and yet they do not get equal praise. There's, there's this impasse, uh, the consequences, you know, how the dice fall, as it were, does matter. And he's got a whole bunch of examples, like the architect, like the general. Um, he says that if, if a friend solicits an office for another friend, yes, he might make example. a perfect, a great effort, do everything he can, but, you know, there's probabilities involved. Right, doesn't get the job. And if no job actually materializes, there's less gratitude. Right. He's, and as a result, we don't praise the helper right. because it didn't happen. That's right. Which is unfair. In, in a, a sense, dimension. it's unfair. He calls it, un, he calls it actually unjust. He says natural, though unjust, which is kind of interesting because there he's say, suggesting that justice isn't always natural. Yeah. Um, other examples uh, is, are, are that, you know, he says the messenger of bad news is disagreeable <laughs> to us. Um, it was that lovely it's the same example. effort as the guy <laughs> delivering any other message. You may not even know what the message is. <laughs> But um, and he gives this historical example, which must have been well known to his contemporaries, but is unknown to us, of the the king who lops off the head of the yeah. messenger delivering the bad news, right? Uh, which uh, is a little unfair. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just but 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 somehow tolerated for Seen some as, yeah. because consequence somehow I don't know. Well, but he talks about he talks about like the guy throwing a large stone over a wall. Yeah, uh, you know, it's some bad person, and, but. You know, so one guy throws a stone, another guy throws a stone. One stone kills somebody. No, neither one have any idea what's on the other side of the wall. The other stone doesn't kill anybody, and the law punishes them differently. Yeah. Same thing with uh, he says someone shooting at somebody. If you just wound them or if you miss them, it's not as punishable as if you kill them. Um, so he's got all this stuff in here about this irregularity, as he puts it. And then he talks some about different kinds of negligence. He starts kind of. Yeah, getting at, um, you know, why we might have this irregularity. Um, and what he comes down to saying is that um, if it were somehow based just on intentions, just on effort, that could create a real inquisition. Like we have to sort of know and judge and scrutinize uh, everybody's efforts and so on. Um but and, and he doesn't say a lot, but he says you know that, that that's that's not going to work, um, and uh, the irregularity he says teaches sacred regard against negligence when others may be hurt. So in other words, having this irregularity sort of in, incense us to do everything we possibly can not to hurt somebody. And so he doesn't make it that clear here, but I think uh, it's basically like a kind of knowledge argument uh, that sustains uh, his resolution of this matter that, um, remember, he specified intention, actions, and consequences. And um, we have such imperfect knowledge uh, or such a knowledge problem in knowing intentions and, for that matter, knowing the bodily actions of what each person did. Um, like, for example, how well the person aimed when yeah. they fired at somebody, right. um, or even if they meant to miss, or even if they meant to fire to hit the leg and extremity right. rather than the heart. It's so hard to know those things that we have to have principles um, as well as these passions and sentiments uh, based on them um, that um, actually – give rise to this, what he calls an irregularity. You know, he, so he doesn't make it. of it as monitoring costs. You know, they're too yeah, high. It's not yeah. worth it. It's too, too destruct, too costly. Yeah, something like that. He doesn't speak very specifically here at all about the knowledge problems, but I do think it's basically, it, it, it's implicit or it sustains what he does make of it. What did you think of it? Well, uh, two things that I, that I thought were worth mentioning in this section. I it, we must mention this delightful passage where he says basically uh, trying to commit a crime is never punished because, you know, the crime never happened. Um, 
You can't really prove it. It's hard to prove it, but even if it's clearly proved that he was trying to commit a crime, if there's no crime, it's never punished as severely as someone who actually commits the crime. So uh, premedita- uh, someone who's trying to kill someone, whether they sh- and, but never shoot, but never, they never shoot. You can get punished, but not as bad as if you shoot and kill. He says there's one exception, which is treason. He says <laughs> that crime no. immediately affecting the being of the government itself, the government is naturally more jealous of it than of any other. In the punishment of treason, the sovereign resents the injuries which are immediately done to himself. In the punishment of other crimes, he resents those which are done to other men. It is his own resentment, which he indulges in the one case. It is that of his subjects, which by sympathy he enters into in the other. In the first case, therefore, as he judges in his own case, he's very apt to be more violent and <laughs> and sanguinary, meaning bloody, in his punishments than the impartial spectator can approve of. His resentment, too, rises here upon smaller occasions and does not always, as in other cases, wait for the perpetration of the crime or even the attempt to commit it. So I thought that was yeah. highly entertaining about, about the, the, pro- the problem with treason. But I'm just, I'm just fascinated by this idea – of how much we respect, inevitably, the people who do things that are positive, or the people, or disrespect the people who do things that are negative, when they are the actors of the cause rather than the planners that don't come to fruition, uh, and the unfairness of that. And for example, I mean, I think about it in in sports all the time. They'll say so and so is a winner. Well, that's nice in tennis or golf. In, in football, it's a kind of silly statement or baseball, and yet it's invoked constantly to praise one player who just by good fortune found himself surrounded by 10 other g- great players. Mm. And this poor wretch who's just as talented and has 10 inadequate or mediocre teammates is is viewed as having a, eh, a so-so career. Yeah. I guess for and, a pitcher especially. Yeah, or a pitcher who doesn't have good batting support. Or And, and it's interesting. I think you know there's a modern attempt to – in sports to try to parse out the real merit of a player using sophisticated – it's called sabermetrics in baseball, and we've talked about it a little bit in past podcasts. And um, for me, I find it extremely – it's disturbing to me that people unfairly assess people's careers based on their, their teammates. And yet Smith's saying it's almost inevitable. It's a part of human nature, and I think later on at the, in Chapter 3, he defends it as – Having socially beneficial characteristics, he says it's you know the author of nature was was designed it that way. Um, well, this is more yeah. He says that necessary rule of justice, therefore, that men in this life are liable to punishment for their actions only, not for their designs and intentions, is founded upon this salutary and useful irregularity in human sentiments concerning merit or demerit, which at first sight appears so absurd and unaccountable. But every part of nature, when attentively surveyed, equally demonstrates the providential care of its author, capital A. And we admire the wisdom of goodness and goodness of God even in the weakness and folly of men. What does he mean there? What is he trying to – why is he saying – I've forgotten where this – what the context of this is. But he's really talking about why this seemingly unjust human tendency to to focus on actions rather than designs or plans – is better than a world where we were more accurate. I don't, yeah, again, I think implicit in his case is the monitoring problem, the knowledge problem. I don't think he makes that as well as he could have, actually, but that would be, um, you know, how he, how he could sustain it and say, given, given that God can't give us that knowledge of each other, um, given that we have the kind of knowledge we do have, this principle that we follow, which seems like an irregularity, actually plays out well. Again, I don't know how sincerely one should take Smith on all the providential stuff. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't have a particular view of this, um, but so much in Smith, it seems to me, is is showing a great appreciation of focal points and, and the importance of... Synchronizing. Harmony. Yes, and that and that you know the, the the reality is a fog, as it were, and there are some stars up there that sparkle somewhat, that flicker, and there's a finite number of focal points, and we kind of have to be comparativist and think about what we can actually build based on the what we've got to work with, and one thing that's very focal is whether how things actually pan out. You know what I mean? How thing you know did the guy did the baseball pitcher win 20 games or not 
um, at least that gives us a focal point upon which uh, for us to proceed in our understandings of propriety and so on, evaluation. And uh, the other step, you know, the, the, the more philosophical abstract sense of justice based on effort or intention sounds nice, but there are no focal points to hang it on, you know? And so as comparativists, it's kind of like, this is better than any alternative we, we've got. Um, that doesn't sound a lot like providential nature, but I suppose the two can be squared because you can say that providential nature is one that gave us this world where we only have so many different focal points to choose from, and uh, we've chosen the best one, at least in this matter. Let me, let me try a different approach, which, which I think actually is in the, is in the next page. He, he's really saying – you're using the – we're talking about the monitoring costs or the imperfect knowledge. Uh, I think – what Smith – the reason Smith wants to justify this emphasis on results would be a better way to say it. Not so much actions. Results over yeah. intention, whether they're good or bad, is uh, we want people to work – it's what you alluded to very briefly in passing. You say, you know, it's hard to get stuff done. You don't want people sitting around saying, hey, I had a great plan. You really <laughs> want them to make an effort to carry it to fruition. Right. Even though there may be many reasons it won't come to fruition that aren't their fault, if we reward people solely on the basis of their intentions, we'll get more intentions and less res and fewer results. Or supposed if we, intentions. And if we yeah. right, even worse because you can't. That's a that's the knowledge problem. Even you know even even worse. If we reward people based on results, they'll work really hard to, to achieve results. And right. I think that's right. his. Yeah. I think that's his justification and why. He yeah, uh, is yeah. happy with the, the author of nature in that setting, at least. Yes, yes. Any, uh, any closing thoughts on no, part two? No, part three is next of the foundation of our judgments concerning our own sentiments and conduct and the sense of duty. So this is more inward looking and it, uh, I think, has more impartial spectator and the earthquake in China and a lot of juicy stuff. Well, we look forward to that conversation. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.